So you guys finally get together. Here we go. Back to the book. It had been three years since Paris and you. So Paris, the guy, was uh, he was the guitarist, the guitarist yeah. from the Cro-Max. Hooked up and started writing November 2nd, 1984. And on February 16th, 1985, the Cro-Mags went into High Five Studios on 27th Street and Park Avenue and recorded 12 songs. The Age of Coral cassette, which is released on CD called Before the Coral. Yeah, that was the original it's version the original of the version. album before we actually went and recorded the album, Age of Coral. So that's 84. Yeah. That that's going down. Yes. And... That's a good recording. I have that yeah. one too. I, have I, that I, I actually like it a lot better than the album I was telling you before. I can't that tell I if never, I, 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 the I, I other like one's so ingrained better. in my head that I expect little things that aren't there. Yeah. And so I, 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 I like the first one better because I think it's just more raw. It is more raw. You know, the, 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 this, it's more explosive. I think it's more true to what we actually sounded like when we played live, you know? Yeah. The other thing, uh, the other one had, you know, a lot of production shit that I wasn't too happy about, but yeah, you know. So now this is where, now you think the story's been crazy so far, Echo? I'll just throw you yes. under the bus right now. The story's been crazy. Now it goes just, takes another kind of, what I, I consider this an even more, more bizarre turn than everything we've talked about so far. So going back to the book, I was into vegetarianism, but it took me a while to get into Krishna. At first, John, this is the, the singer from the Cro-Mags or one of the singers that sang in the Cro-Mags. John and me used to go to the trucks where they served free food in Tom, Tompkins Square Park, which was a big hangout back in the yeah, day. Yeah. We, everyone used to go there and hang out. A lot of hardcore kids did. I mean, I was living in a squat. I was vegetarian. I had no money. And here was free vegetarian food. They also had a few preaching centers on the west side that me and John used to go to to eat. But still, it took a while for to give a fuck about what they were saying. I was there for the free food. I wasn't looking for religion. I was just hungry and trying to survive. We would always show up late. John would tell us when the good time was just to get the food after the reading and preaching and everything. But over time, I really started getting into the philosophy. In the beginning, people didn't take John and Krishna seriously. It was kind of something the hardcore scene laughed at. But as my friends and me started getting into Krishna, it started to change. So you guys started getting into Hari Krishna. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Which yes, yes. it's pretty fucking you know, funny looking back now. Tell me the fundamental <clears throat> philosophies. I mean, obviously Hari Krishnas are vegetarians yes. because they don't want to like hurt you know animals. Actually, it's more to it than that. That's actually not why. It's because uh, now I'm going to start fucking talking all their shit. Well, give me a little uh, okay, bit of it's understanding. Like, you know, they, they, they only eat foods that are offerable to God, and you can't offer God a rotting carcass to eat. Okay. You know, there's there's nothing that has to do with like, hey, we don't want to hurt things. Oh, uh, there's all this karmic stuff. You know, everybody likes to you know not make more karma for themselves good or bad see that's know? what i'm saying like this is why this is why it gets more bizarre to me yeah because no, your try got to create some more karma yeah, for yeah. yourself well, see that's the thing is with the amount of karma i had already <laughs> created for myself <laughs> i was trying but this is where it gets even more fucked up and twisted because you got me and my friends who were like recovering skinheads for lack of a better way of putting it you know dudes who used to go out and get in like you know 20 fights in a night, you know, put 19 people in ICU just because, you know, just walking from the east side to the west side. What you looking at? Bah! You know, fuck you ah, all night, just fucking wild. And, you know, and then all that shit with pig man and this and that. And God knows how many other things, you know, how many bodies I found and came across and, and you know, how many, how much madness I had it experienced you know like we were talking about you know it's like sometimes you know you, when you're dealing with life and death on a regular basis you know sometimes you're like you know god you start calling out to god you don't even know what the fuck god is and you're just like god help me god you know please you know guide me help it's this the call of of desperation you know and um I had never been into Christianity and this and that. I just it all just sounded like a bunch of bullshit to me. And and here I was actually hearing some things that made some sort of sense to my teenage mind. You know, <laughs> karma. Ooh, you know, all these other things that like were like resonating with me, you know, and it's like 
I needed that shit, you know? I needed some sort of guidance, and had I not had something like that, I mean, it could have been fucking Buddha, it could have been whatever, you know? But I needed something that was greater than You needed than some man. kind of guidance in your life. I needed right? guidance, I needed hope. Some kind hope. of discipline. I needed hope. Oh, hope, yeah. You know? And when I started going out to their farm for a little while, like they were getting up, we were getting up at like, 5 30 in the morning and meditating and watching the sun come up and like it was like this whole you know it going from like being like hunted by the gangs in my neighborhood to that it was just like i can't even really explain it it really it was like I don't know how to fucking put it, man. It was just like, it was like, here I am at peace. Like, yeah, wow, I was going to say, peace. it sounds like, like peace like, for the, the first time. Like, whoa. You know, so that, but then uh, the more I was involved in it, the more I seen, you know, that people in religions in general are, are typically a bunch of fucking hypocrites. You know, you get a lot of people preaching a lot of shit that they don't all fucking follow and all rules don't really fit all people. You know, every human is different and, and not everybody can follow the same guidelines. And and when is when do things start becoming just belief? And what the fuck is belief anyway? It's just what you choose to believe, you know, unless it's like this is real. You know, this is really cutting my face. That's really blood. This is, you know, I really have to eat food and breathe air. Belief is just that, you know. And I, I, uh, I still have, you know, my spiritual inclinations. I still believe in some sort of, I don't like to say the word God anymore because I don't, I, I, I don't have that overview that I know any fucking thing. I just know, uh, I know I got a lot of love in my heart for the people I care about and I know I, I want to try to do good things. You know, I've done enough bad things. I'd like to try to prevent some people from experiencing what I experienced. And at the same time, I would like to share the the, the great experiences that I, that I had with people, you know? Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the great experiences and one of the things, the great things that you shared with people is that, that album, that, that album and we'll go to here, going back to the book, The Age of Coral. Some would call it one of the most, if not the most influential New York hardcore and crossover albums. It was recorded and mixed in under 100 hours over a 14 day period, January, February, 1986 at East Side Sound by Steve Remote and Chris Williamson, our manager and so-called producer, but it was really Steve. So 86 comes around and you guys put together The Age of Coral. Yeah. And this is the, the one that got released on a bigger yeah, scale. Yeah, it was like the first hardcore. Is that profiled? Yeah, it was I, probably one of the first hardcore records to ever be put out on a real major label, like something that wasn't like Discord yeah. or, or or Slash Records or something underground. Yeah, and and now this is, you guys are, you guys are starting to get a big draw. I mean, huge draws yeah. outside of New York City. Yeah, we were starting to tour at this point and doing, you know, we our first big break was touring with Motorhead. <sighs> and then we got, uh, you know, we went on to play with many other metal bands at around that time. P uh, the whole crossover thing right. started happening. So, yeah, for those of you that don't know, crossover, when he's talking about <clears throat> that, that's the crossover from hardcore to metal and kind of it, combining it, it was really the when the metalheads started discovering hardcore right. when people like metallica started wearing gbh shirts and coming to see the chromags yeah when people like anthrax started daring to come to cbgb's yeah you know and that's really but, but the hardcore band started getting more metallic too. well yeah because like metalheads started shaving their heads and getting into hardcore like the kid like yourself yeah, like kids who had been listening yeah, yeah, to van but, halen but, when they were little who started getting into hardcore? But, but later hardcore on. bands started getting more metallic. Yeah, don't yeah. You think? No, no, we we definitely yeah, did. I mean, I mean you did Agnostic yeah, Front. Did. Yeah, no, they. A lot of people lot tried of those, to yeah. jump ship. You know, I yeah. guess you know. I don't. I say that kind of jokingly, but I guess you know. It seemed like there was more uh, opportunity to actually make a living. Bigger or, audience. You know, bigger audience. You know, actual record deals. You know, Pantera. 
Pantera, fucking Cause, great band. Because Pantera. I mean, one of my favorite bands, probably, you know, Dimebag, uh, fucking love that dude. Um, one of the g- worst tragedies imaginable uh, to uh, music is motherfucker got shot on stage Crazy. man by a fucking psychotic fan i mean it's like you know yeah. what the fuck man yeah that was awful yeah yeah it's uh yeah i mean not to not to talk about not to get into you know the whole chromag beef and this and that but like one thing i will say is you know it really bothers me that uh Dimebag died like that and that they never because I know they would have buried the hatchet by now and they would have done an, an amazing yeah. reunion tour and they would they would have just kicked the shit out of everybody <laughs> and they'll never have that opportunity now because yeah. he was robbed from us and to know that my band are such a bunch of stubborn immature fucking old assholes that yeah. we could never actually embrace each other purely based on what we did achieve together and how many fans would be so happy you know because once once you're gone you're gone and you know it's very rare that four or five people will have that chemistry for a moment in Mm -hmm. in life so you know just based on that alone it's pretty fucking sad and pathetic you know yeah and it's a weird run that you guys had because you guys you guys you guys were on the verge yeah i mean yeah and and when i you know when i remember you guys um touring and i didn't see you on the age of coral tour because that was a really fast tour and you went to yeah Europe and i just we, didn't have yeah. the opportunity to see you but uh i saw you on the best wishes tour which was the next album that came out and you guys were big i mean yeah. you guys were, and for, we were for, just to kind of put it in perspective for people like i think the the places where i saw you play and this is kind of a national brand, is the House of Blues. If you've ever been to House of Blues, I yeah, saw you at a place that was like yeah, as big as the play, House of Blues. We like, used to play there a lot. Okay, yeah, I didn't yeah. know you actually no, played there, have, but yeah. like that kind of venue. So that's, in my mind, you know, that's a yeah, legit band. That's a band decent that, venue. You yeah. know, I mean, when you're playing places that size, you can make a living. And, you, and if you keep going and stay consistent, you know, you can do fairly well for yourself. But Now, now this is the, so... You know, Age of Coral comes out. You guys are popular. You tour Europe. You know, you're getting yeah. after it. You're you're filling up places. Uh, best wishes. You're filling stuff. You're headlining. Best wishes. But you're playing with Motorhead too. Before. Yeah. You're supposed to play with Black Sabbath one time. Yeah. By the way, that would actually be the ultimate show of all time for I me. I have to fucking agree. For me, because my favorite dude. band Black of all Sabbath, time is Us and Motorhead. Yeah, that's, would just that's knock it, it the yeah. fuck out. <laughs> that I would mean, that would have been epic. Yeah, but Black no, Sabbath didn't yeah, show up. Yeah. Man. yeah. Yeah, because they were having yeah, some issues, yeah. but uh, yeah, that that and but you just have the, the flyer. flyer yeah, alone. you have the flyer in the book, dude. <laughs> just the flyer you have alone. The flyer in the book. That's fucking, awesome, dude. Yeah. I, you know, I made it on a flyer with Black Sabbath yeah. and Motorhead. You're okay? good. You're good. <laughs> I'm gold, you can die dude. now. <laughs> but here's the crazy thing: as I was reading the book, I couldn't believe this. You come home from those tours, yeah, man, and uh, you have no money. Yeah, yeah. And you hear this, this is kind of like a rock and roll myth, right? Oh, the guy signs the contract, the, the producer. Yeah. And I, I've watched a bunch of uh, uh, programs about this. And what the, what the record companies do is they say, hey, look, we're going to give you $100,000 advance for your next album. And then you go, awesome. So they give you a hundred grand, and you start spending it. And, you, and then they back charge you for your studio time and the promotion. And next thing mm-hmm. you know, literally, at the end... You, you haven't even gone on tour. You owe them twenty twenty eight yeah, thousand dollars. You're working to pay it off. <laughs> yeah, they lent you this money yeah. with interest, and so that's yeah. the kind of shit that was happening with you. Yeah, and you come back off these tours. You're famous because also at this time, now that I think about it, you and the Chrome Mags, you guys were like on the cover of like the metal we magazines were in, and stuff. It, all those stupid metal magazines, yeah. man. You'd turn, they'd be like Skid Row on one page and us on yeah. the next. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Ozzy on one page, me on the next. You yeah. Know? So you were there. I mean, yeah, you were, we, well, were, I, we were on the cusp. We were right there. about to break it, you know. And you were still broke. Still, you yeah, would come home man. from those tours and still be living on the streets. I would, I would be coming off those tours and trying to figure out where I was staying, Damn. or I'd be showing up at my grandmother's house, you know, or I'd be like, you know, yeah, we got pretty fucked, man. But you know, you don't know what you don't know, you know. <laughs> so it's like when when you're a kid and uh, 
you ain't got no guidance, nobody looking out for you. You know, you make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, and also back then they had a much better monopoly. The, the yeah, the, companies. the industry Here, they nowadays, really knew how to screw you. You can say, then. oh, you know what? I'll just make my own record and yeah, I'll, I'll be able the, to distribute it through it, yeah, the YouTube internet and, and, and social that, media and, blah, and all blah, this blah. other stuff. You know, that would have been helpful in those days as far as, you know, but, um, you know, it, I think that the internet and everything is also really kind of fucked music up because it's like people don't have to have any, uh, lineage or any uh, connection to their roots anymore it's like people who don't know anything can just google it and cut it and paste it and call it their own and the next thing you know they're an artist and it's like no you're not a fucking artist you're a fucking cut and paste motherfucker who hasn't ever actually experienced a fucking thing and you don't even know the history of what you're imitating you well, just know that you're into it right now so you're imitating yeah, it right now the, the other crazy thing is you know it was hard to get like these records when I was a kid. Yeah, you, you, had, you had to know. You couldn't order them. You, no. you had to like get somebody that was going to go to New York and, hey, if they have this album, can you pick it Will up? Will you go me? to Bleaker Bob's and yeah, grab it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go to Bleaker. and it was like that. Yeah. You couldn't just, yeah, yeah. but nowadays, you can, if you say, oh, the Cro-Mags are cool because I heard a song, you put them into Google, you get Cro-Mags, you get every other band that's been related to them, you get Bounds That Sound Like Them, and you can just download them all immediately, yeah. and it's no factor. It's kind of crazy. That's why, for me, like, you know, how many record, total record albums I had, and I loved music, I probably had like 80 records, right? 80 records. On my computer right now, on my phone, I probably got 10,000 records. No, I got all kinds of songs, yeah. right? Every band that's ever existed, I got them on my phone. Dude, and you, you, you would shit if you saw my fucking I vinyl. bet you it was Dude, sick you, you would shit. <laughs> you would fucking be like, like a kid in a candy store, man. You fucking, because I got everything from back then. I got it Damn. all. I got like motorhead test pressings. Uh, I got like you're one of those yeah, guys that I goes mean, out got, and gets test pressings. You know, like, <laughs> I was watching some video with uh, Rollins because you know Rollins. Has, yeah, no, dude, I he think, has my I, first single. He bought it from me. When, uh, yeah, he's like, I think he he might have one of the most epic record collections. Probably some of the yeah. stuff that he and he likes weird stuff. Too. Yeah, he likes stuff that like yeah. I, I wouldn't want it, but he's got you know first pressings, yeah. test pressings. He's a freak. Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> <laughs> and he's got money too. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. Yeah, he's yeah. Super um, cool people. You end up trying to trying to sue a little bit. I think you tried to sue the record company or something. And you end up just going into legal what, costs. Yeah, what we were trying, what grand. happened was we were trying desperately to get off of our record label and get away from our management because uh, we got to a certain point where we were just on the verge of blowing up, and Profile was was still treating us like chumps. You know, we weren't getting no money. We weren't getting anything. We were getting treated like fucking dog shit. And um, someone who was working at Electra was interested in signing us. So we were like, Electra, oh, Metallica, oh, here's our fucking shot. So we like got into- Profile, Profile was like big, all metalish, right? No, Profile was actually a hip hop label. So oh, okay. what they did with us was really kind of- Out there? Uh, out there because they had, you know, their big band Isn't it was- like Century Media slash- That came after, no, oh, okay. no, no. Uh, Profile was big for Run DMC. Oh, okay. That was who their, and, and then like Rob Bass- uh, it takes two. Yeah. It takes two. That was like their those big. They, that was their hits. Run DMC was their main shit. Speaking of crossover, <clears throat> Run DMC. Yeah, they brought the metal, yeah, dude, the they, riffs. Yeah, I mean, you know, they those guys were great, man. I saw that <laughs> for I saw sure. That, I saw them play so many times back in the day. I remember seeing them with the Beastie Boys at the Garden, and that that was a fucking great show. It's fun, man. <laughs> it's like all the, the Beastie Boys brought all like the, the the little white kids and Run DMC brought all the black kids and the black kids were just walking around robbing all the white kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting there fucking laughing my fucking dick off, like watching people just get yoked in the fucking aisles. I'm like, this shit is hilarious. Yeah. It was funny. Oh damn! So you were trying to get off that label, yeah, and trying to get onto Electra. Damn, because Electra was a huge. Yeah, thing. yeah, that would have been a good move for us, but um, Profile didn't like us. Us and they would have rather taken, you know, they, you, you couldn't offer them enough money to, to give us our freedom. They were like, fuck these dudes. Damn. Yeah, we had some issues with some of the head people there. And uh, then you end up, so with, uh, with Alpha Omega. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't say this, but you sang on Best Wishes. Yeah, I sang, John, on, I sang on like half the albums, oh, okay. more or less, you know. And then me and John both sang on, on Alpha Omega. On Alpha Omega. And I got to read this from the book. 
because I got a kick out of it. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Here he goes, back to the book. You know how you can always tell when a heavy band is starting to lose their edge when they start using a fucking keyboard? Yeah, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, to be fair, <laughs> I was eating a lot of mushrooms at that recording session. So like things sounded a little bit different to me and they were sounding the keyboard sounded cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was eating all kinds of mushrooms and drinking mushroom tea, and I was like, "Yeah, that shit sounds cool." Dig. Yeah, roll with that, you know. That was, <laughs> but see, uh, at least I can look back and laugh at myself. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like if you can't fucking laugh at yourself, man, you're an asshole. And some other, I think I might have breezed through it, but there's another point where you're talking about how spinal tapish, like yeah. all this, and even that spinal tapish, right? When yeah, you start yeah. adventuring yeah. out, yeah. you no, no shit. Court. Yeah, you know, the, uh, Stonehenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, Ed, do, do you want to hear something really fucking funny? I mean, me, me and Doug watched Spinal Tap with John one time, just just, just to show you a bit, little bit about his intellect. All right, we're watching about halfway through that movie. John turns to me and Doug goes, "Yo, man, these guys suck. I've never even heard of them. Why did they make a movie about them?" <laughs> <laughs> Me and Doug just look at each other like, this motherfucker thinks this is a real documentary. Uh, oh my fucking! Anyway, sorry, I had to. Hey, you know what? I've seen I've seen Spinal Tap mm -hmm. twice the, live. Oh, I saw yeah. them once. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have a Spinal Tap lighter. Yeah, yeah that's what's up. <laughs> I brought my wife, and you know when they play big bottoms, you know they all play bass. Yeah, the whole yeah, band yeah, gets yeah. out basses. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that was a fucking brilliant fucking movie. <laughs> No, but I remember like being in those clubs where you're find, trying to find the stage. You're walking around. You're like, all right, Cleveland. All right, Cleveland. You're like fucking walking around. You wind up outside the club. You're like, where the fuck is the stage? You know, yeah. Uh,